Great. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we'll be in a very, I'm Laura Anderson. I'm the chair and executive director of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. We have a super full agenda today with some very exciting uh, new activity and then some uh, really cool uh, lightning round style updates from some of the PIs uh, for the ocean acidification hypoxia projects that we have funded. So you have the agenda before you. I will not, uh, I will not reread it, but I just want to take a few minutes to introduce uh, ourselves as board members. And so I think I will um, start, uh, I'm going to put your name, uh, I'm just going to put your name list in the chat and that might be an easy way. You could just uh, introduce yourselves in order of um, the chat if you have that available to you. So we'll start with Representative Gomber. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Senator Anderson is here. And the other members of the trust, uh, Christine and Christina and then Steve. I'm here, um, as I said, um, it looks like I'm surrounded by a number of people that are from Newport, so that's where I am today. So thank you. Hello, I'm Christina Volnikovsky. I'm a member of the trust. Hi, Steve Marks, a member of the trust. Thank you. And we do have one vacant position still for a voting trust member. So any interested parties out there, there is a link on our Ocean Science Trust website that uh, gives more information about how to apply for that vacant position. I'd also um, like to ask staff uh, to introduce uh, themselves. We're housed under DSL. So uh, Jean and Rena and Andy, could you introduce yourselves, please? So hi, I'm Jean Strait and I'm the Deputy Director at DSL for Administration. Hello, my name is Raina Aguiar. I am offering the administrative support for East um, under DSL. Hello, this is Andy Lanier. Can you hear me? Yes. Andy Lanier, Marine Affairs Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Great. And then I am, um, are there any other DSL staff members on the call? I don't see any as such. Um, let's just take a really quick um, walk around the uh, pres uh, just the presenters. I'll be introducing you a little bit before your presentation, but I'll just call off your name if you could just state your name and affiliation. It's always nice to know who's in the blacked out squares and because <laughs> we can't see you in the audience. So I'm just going to follow um, my list. Uh, George Waldbesser. Hi, um, I'm George Wallbuster. I'm a professor at Oregon State University, and I'll be presenting sometime later today on our Olympia Oyster Equina work. And Steve Rumrell, please. Yes, hi, I'm Steve Rumrell. I'm with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Marine Resources Program, and I'm the shellfish program leader. And Francis Chan. Hi, everyone. Francis Chan. I'm also a professor at Oregon State University. Bob Cowan. On mute, Bob. Sorry, been on here since eight this morning. <laughs> uh, Bob Cowan, uh, Hatfield Marine Science Center. And uh, Cinnamon. Hi, I'm Cinnamon Moffitt. I also work at Hatfield Marine Science Center as a research program manager. Nadia. Nadia Gardner up here on the North Coast representing um, the Oregon Ocean Conservation Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation. And Joanna. Hi, I'm Joanna Lyle from the Nature Conservancy. Great, and uh, Dave Fox. Yeah, hi, I'm Dave Fox with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Marine Resources Program. 
um, I'm at the Hotfield Marine Science Center as well. Dave, good to see you. Uh, and Steve, you're right there next to Dave. Yeah, Rumro? You're on mute, sir. I already introduced myself. <laughs> Shellfish program coordinator for those of you who came on late at ODFNW. Uh, Jennifer Lamb. Hi everyone, Jennifer Lamb, director at Eastern Research Group and also an Oregon State Marine Resources Management alum. You say Eastern Research Group? Correct. All right, uh, Gina Carter, I see you're here. I'm Gina Carter, I'm with the Nature Conservancy in Oregon. Great, thanks for joining us, and Joe? Yeah, I'm Joe Liebeslight with Portland Audubon, and I'm also on OPAC. And Charlie is with us. I hear Charlie Plyben coming in. How about Bob Bailey? Bob Bailey is present and accounted for. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Charlie, we, I think we lost Charlie. Uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing from him later. Did I miss anybody who would like to introduce themselves? Did I skip a square? Did somebody jump in? All right, very good. Um, then we'll get down to business. Um, I'd like to ask for an approval of the meeting summary that was sent uh, for February, the meeting summary for February 15th, 2022. It was a very short half hour meeting. Any? I move to approve those summary minutes. Okay. I'll second that here. Okay, and for members, all in favor, signify by saying aye, raising your hand. Aye. 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 All right, great. Yes, great job on the meeting minutes. Very simple and to the point. Thank you. Um, great. Well, that moves us into our exciting news. Um, Laura, can I just inter interrupt before you give us the exciting news? With a Yes, absolutely. In because we've got such a small number of voting members, I'm concerned about the ongoing vacancy. Do we have any news about possible appointments or uh, application process? Or if we know a warm body, who do we have them call? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Representative Gomberg. Um, Christy, did you have a response to that? Yeah, um, they, uh, formerly the Sea Grant director was part of this group and we have just uh, been informed that the new Sea Grant director will be uh, coming in, uh, an official duty, I believe in June and probably uh, someone can correct me on that, but that was the announcement that we got. So I, I, would, I would think that we might want to consider her um applying just to verify she's coming her start date is june 1st uh and uh you know that's certainly a, a reasonable thing to consider for sure yeah great recommendation i um i have not received any direct inquiries um I did just put the link in the chat to the um, official announcement online, and um, it has the, you know, how to where to submit a letter of interest to. Um, I too am concerned, Representative Godberg, that we have gone some time. I'm fully expecting that, given the increase in activity and also visibility of the oost with some of the press releases that lisa i miss lisa in the um she didn't say anything she's so modest uh lisa de uh will be addressing us about the oeh funding and she just put out some press releases i think that should attract some interest and hopefully some good candidates for us Um, any other comments or, or recommendations on filling our vacancy? Okay. I will, um, 
I will then go on to the exciting news, um, which is the allocation under House Bill 5202 for a million dollars for nearshore research. And that happened quite quickly and um, was facilitated by many people. I wanna give a particular shout out to Bob Bailey. He was in conversation with the governor's office about interest in the governor had in supporting nearshore research. And I just happened to ping him at a very fortuitous time where he was able to think to himself, hmm, maybe Oost is the place where that funding could go and be parked. And in fact, it was a great fit. So I wanna thank Bob for helping to facilitate that. Um, but more so, I'd like to thank our Senator and Representative for supporting um, that budget process and wanted to ask if either uh, Senator Anderson or Representative Gomberg would like to comment on um, the, the allocation. And actually, perhaps before we do, I should just uh, really quickly, I'll put in the chat um, what that language is uh, specifically, there's um, a little bit of lead up to it, but I'll put in a, um, here that it's a million dollars for science and monitoring on near store keystone species, including sea otters, near shore marine ecosystems, kelp and eelgrass habitat and sequestration of blue carbon. I was I was pausing respectfully to see if the senator wanted to uh, add anything. Um, Laura, this is indeed uh, good and exciting news. And as you mentioned, it came out in um, in the the end of session reconciliation bill, which is sometimes awkwardly referred to as the Christmas tree bill. Uh, the point that I wanted to make is that that this year and the last uh, year when we did the long session. We had more money than we anticipated, and a lot of things went into the end of session um, investments. Um, I don't want anybody to uh, to think that uh, that the path is clear for this to continue in future years. I'm certainly hopeful that it would be, and having it makes it easier to keep getting. But there were a lot of unusual one-time expenditures in this measure, and um, and we are one of the beneficiaries of that. Uh, let's hope that we can continue the process, but I don't want to give anybody um, um, <clears throat> unrealistic expectations going forward. If we want to do this again, we're going to have to work hard to make it happen. And Laura, thank you, uh, Representative Gomberg. Well said. And a reminder that uh, we had hoped and uh, kind of requested $2 million, um, and that's a, a sign you know, that got cut back a little bit because there were uh, uh, certainly a lot of uh, requests for the funding, but uh, I'm hopeful that with our uh, press releases and the work uh, updates, you know, that uh, more and more attention uh, will be given and, uh, you know, uh, recognition from for this group and, and the work done. So, but I, I would echo uh, Representative Gomberg's um, point well taken that, uh, you know, we were fortunate this biennium with uh, funding and, you know, we We'll just keep working at it, but not to expect it uh, without a, a strong uh, lobbying request. Yes. Uh, well, thank you both. Um, when I think about what the OOS responsibility is here, it's, it's big. Um, and for us to be successful in this and to continue to be successful, I think there's a few things that we need to focus on and I'd like to ask for board uh, support on some decisions today. Um, I think we had a really good uh, experience working with the OAH Council and uh, Lisa uh, assisting Oost in doing the $1 million, completing a $1 million competitive grants program for OAH. So we can look to that in terms of timeframe, 
for how we can get the funds out responsibly and quickly. And um, I have a very loosely, um, I'm gonna do a quick screen share here. One moment. Uh, kind of a loose uh, plan of attack for timing. Um, it does not look like my screen is sharing. Is that correct? I don't sharing. see it. No, we I can, see it. We yeah. can yeah. it. Okay, that's interesting. I don't see it. But uh, so based on our experience with the OAH, um, the difference, one of the differences between the OAH programs and the Marine Reserves is that OAH was highly specifically directed towards key projects with specific amounts. It's going to take this, us a couple of months just to get to that part. Um, this uh, new allocation isn't coming to us with as much specificity. So being able to do project identification at multiple levels um, certainly including the initial $1 million allocation, but looking beyond that too, as we're identifying projects as one of the ways that OOST can really prove its worth to the state is to try to leverage these funds with other funds to increase that pool from 1 million to perhaps doubling it or more. So um, one of the things that I would like to ask the board for today is approval to uh, convene a project uh, subcommittee that would work on outlining what are the priorities for the state and how much of the grant would we allocate towards each of those. That's easily a two month process. Um, once we have that, um, ident those projects identified, I think we would need to come back to the board for approval of those projects. Um, and we may, if we're moving quickly, we may need to call a special meeting in June. If not, we have our July meeting and I certainly wouldn't want to exceed that time frame beyond July. Um, after the approval of which projects are prioritized and how much budget for each, we would go into RFP writing and review. We had a very effective RFP subcommittee for the OAH process. That was about a three month process. So I'm assuming it would be about the same. Um, if we were on that track, we might be publishing those RFPs by the fall and collecting responses through the fall um, with the help of a contractor to manage that as Lisa's doing for the OAH right now. Um, and then there's another subcommittee that evaluates scores and selects the um, awardees. That might be happening as soon as uh, the end of this year with the possibility that awards could be going out um, by early next year. So that's kind of what my experience with the OAH translating forward into the Marine Reserves might look like, give or take a few buffer months here and there. Um, any questions from the board or any thoughts on that process. I did have a question, if I may. Um, sure. uh, one of the things that I want to follow up from Senator Anderson's <clears throat> comments, and it relates to this, <clears throat> is I, I think the timing is just right on this, but uh, decision packages for the next biennium to continue being able to invest in this work, uh, those, dis those policy option packages you know, would have to be submitted by uh, DSL this summer by the end of July. So I do wanna put that somewhere out for discussion today uh, because I just don't know how much the timing of how we're going through this process might potentially influence the development of the policy option package for continued funding to continue this work. 
Yeah, I think the timing works out quite well indeed. Um, the type of committee, you know, well, I envision this committee being uh, fairly diverse, including um, agency um, scientists, university scientists, um, members of the NGO and conservation community coming together. So they're already working within their departmental budgets often on what's needed. So this would be a really good space to talk about how OOST could potentially support that going forward if OOST has a role to play to support agencies in that or what agencies are planning to do um, in their biennial packages as it is. So I think the timing should be good for that conversation, Lisa. Steve, did you have uh, something? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, just looking at the first box in the table that you listed and looking at the, the figure 1 million to 2.5 million um, and just thinking that that's a, that's a pretty large variance and depending on where we land within that will have a lot to do with determining the scope um, and maybe even the the substance of um, of some of the project ideas we come up with. Um, so, just was wondering if you at this point have ideas about where that additional one one to one point five or whatever it is might come from. Where there are option uh, opportunities to leverage the um, the existing one million, or if there's a plan in place for that, um, so that we can have a reasonable because at two months. To try and raise, to try and identify an additional one to one point five million dollars seems um, <clears throat> seems ambitious and and and, and great. Um, but I'm just wondering if if there are ideas about how to make that pot larger so that we can then make informed decisions about what the substance and scope of the ideas that we have are. Yes, and uh, to answer that question, I do have one idea. I've got one big kind of request that I'm going to ask for approval from this board to proceed with. Uh, Congresswoman Bonamici has a request out for community development um, awards that she would support through the fiscal year 23 appropriations process. This just landed in my email box. I looked through it and found that we had a, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again so you can see what I'm looking at. Um, so um, we have a fit with uh, one of the opportunities under Department of Commerce um, requesting funds for research demonstration or education projects performed by external partners um, or for prioritizing NOAA internal funds for geographically specific projects aligning with NOAA's mission. And this is where we could potentially leverage my request to them. I, I spoke with her staff on the phone this week. Um, the last year was the first year that this program was ran. There were I think about a dozen awards and they average 750,000 each. So I don't think a million dollar request is out of the um, ballpark. Those um, are due by the end of next week, but it's not a very robust, uh, highly detailed grant request process at this point. It's really just a portal through the Congresswoman's website where you um, indicate generally what you want to do with the funds and then there's a follow up after that. So I think we're a good fit. Staff thinks that it's a good fit. The Congresswoman is particularly interested in blue carbon um, and carbon sequestration is a huge uh, priority for her. If you recall, we had a presentation from Ali Nadev, um, former staff to Congresswoman Bonamici just a few meetings back. So we developed a rapport with the office and um, that's my big ask. The reason why I took it all the way to 2.5 is that if we have 
state funds and federal funds working together, then maybe there are private uh, funds that could also be leveraged in to really do what I believe OOST was set up and designed to do, and that's leverage funds, stack capital, bring more money into the state for nearshore research. Laura, yes. Dean, I just want to make sure you know we need to get, if we're going to apply for any federal money, we need to get a 10 day notification to the legislature. So we have to notify them that we're going to be doing this. It sounds like it's a little bit more of a different process than official, but we have to notify them we're going to uh, apply for any kind of federal grants. Thank you, Jean. Also, um, we back six years ago in 2006 had developed a whole two day workshop and report around. I just put a link in the chat around um, nearshore research priorities. And so while that is six years old, I would venture to guess that most of those priorities have not been met and that those needs are still out there and relevant. That um, report really broke down comprehensive research and monitoring program needs for the state at 1 million, at 1 to 3 million, and at 3 to 5 million per biennium. So we're kind of at the beginning edge of that. Um, I like that we have already done a lot of this work. So as the committee convenes to think about what are the priorities of the state and how we should use the money in hand, the million dollars in hand, we'll use this as a starting reference point for the conversation. And many of the people on this call right now were part of that initial summit. And hopefully many of the people on this call right now will be part of our project committee moving forward as well. A lot to process, yes. And we will have plenty of time in public comment to take um, any um, feedback from members of the public. So because we have such a packed agenda today, I have to be a little bit strict with our time and make sure that we are able to start our presentations on time. So I'm gonna limit uh, conversation right now to the OOST board. Uh, any other questions or comments from the board? Um, I do want to queue up a few um, requests that I have for motions so that we can um, take some next steps and uh, get our ducks in a row. All right. I um, I guess the first uh, request that I have is to engage a, a contractor to um, help manage this project um, as Lisa has done for the ocean acidification and hypoxia work. Similarly, we have a, a need for this uh, project as well. So, I had asked uh, staff to send in the meeting agenda a draft of, trying to find my windows management here, a draft of uh, a scope of work for uh, a contractor. And I um, believe it would be a good idea to get board approval to put out, uh, an RFP if necessary, or to extend um, with our existing contractor if that is feasible, but knowing that we need some administrative support to make this happen. 
Were there any questions or comments on the scope of work that was forwarded? I'm unable to find my copy all of a sudden. Just has a list of all of the activities that we had. Lisa, pretty much the same list that Lisa has done for OAH, plus some additional. It will be a bigger lift for a contractor than the OAH. And that's because the OAH funds were um, a collaboration between UST and the OAH Council. So they brought technical resources to the table for writing the RFP, for example, which is a really big job, um, just RFP writing itself. We would, or we would be kind of, I wouldn't say on our own because we have so many partners, but uh, you know, we would really be taking lead on this. So I think it's a slightly larger scope of work than what we had done before. Oh, Laura, is it possible to screen share that? Can, uh, I can try to do it unless somebody else has if easier you access could, to Christina, it. Christina, that would be great. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can. I, I think Raina put it in the chat. Laura, I just oh, added that. Oh, oh yes. There it is. Okay. Oh, great. And um, <laughs> Madam Chair, just to make sure that I correctly understand what you're asking for. You are looking for a motion to do, to approve the, the draft scope of work and to approve development of, of an RFP and or extending the existing contract uh, with Lisa. Is that? Yes, and this is where I get a little bit, um, this is where, uh, <laughs> Luis, the former chair, was so much better versed in how uh, policy happens. So I'm just assuming that it would be good for us to have a motion for that. Jean, can you give me some thumbs up or thumbs down if I'm on? Yeah, I, I, I would agree, especially after all that we went through uh, with DOJ and authorities. So I think this is a good, uh, you need to have the trust approve this scope of work moving forward with this and either um, putting out an RFP for these services or extending the contract with Lisa. Um, and that would depend on the dollar amount and um, other factors, but that they give you the ability to move forward and approve this working with DSL. Thank you, Jean. And do we need to make a determination at this meeting at this time relative to the choice between an RFP or extension of existing contract, or can we include both of those options in a motion and make that decision at a later time? Yes, you can include both of those and you can delegate that final decision to Laura as well. Thank you, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And can you see, I'm trying to screen share. Can you see my Yes. Screen? Okay, great. I just wasn't sure if you still wanted to take a look or if anybody had any questions about any of these items. Is that easier to read? Uh, yes. Um... I, I feel like this is pretty comprehensive. Again, we had great um, experience with OAH, so we kind of know what to expect. Um, I very much um, have enjoyed working with Lisa, as I think the whole core team has, and would love to see that work continue here. I just uh, wasn't sure if we would be required to go out and get, you know, the requisite three um, proposal for review uh, kind of, of thing. So I didn't get an, I didn't get that queued up prior to this meeting. So it'd be good to have both options available, but I think Lisa would be an excellent candidate to continue working with us on these kinds of projects. Uh, I would certainly support that, Laura. Uh, if we need to do both, then to keep the flexibility, that's fine. But um, given uh, Lisa's experience in doing this, I, I would agree to extend her contract as well. 
as a proposal. Jean, um, can you perhaps respond to whether we would be required to go out to um, open contract again for this? Uh, no, I don't think you would. I think the issue that I have to go back and look at is how much the total contract would be after we did this amendment because procurement has, there are laws around how much the dollar amount and what vehicle you get the, that on. So um, I would just have to go back and look. I don't see this as an issue. Um, but I would have to get more specifics to be definitive. Well, we Jean, could make the motion to go either way and that way we have the flexibility. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I make a motion then to, unless there's more discussion, I would make a motion to extend the contract for Lisa to include this uh, pending looking at the sole proprietorship option through, uh, through DAS. I would Great. second that, um, provided Lisa is willing on this conversation. <laughs> oh, strong armor. <laughs> Great. Uh, any, if there's no further question, all in favor say aye. 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 What, what oh, do, yes, go ahead. Sorry, do we need to approve? The, do we need to approve the draft scope of work? Officially, um, Jean. Um, sorry, I I honestly don't know. I don't think you do. I think um, I think that you can. You've shared this, and they can get back to you if they have any comments or concerns. I don't think they necessarily do. They've approved that you're, they're okay with moving forward with a contract with someone, preferably Lisa, first choice. And I think that's all you need. Okay. Well, perhaps to be on the safe side, Christina, would you be comfortable amending your motion to also include approval of the draft scope of work? That way we've got that base covered in the event that uh, we are questioned on it. Yes, of course, Madam Chair. I move to approve this draft scope of work and uh, to hire a contractor or renew Lisa's um, contract with us to help us with this work. Great. All right, second. I accept the modification, second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great, motion passes. I also would like to request approval uh, to notify the legislature of intent to request uh, $1 million through the Community Resources Fund uh, through Congresswoman Bonamici's office. So moved. A second. Second. Okay, and Christine, did you have a question? I just have a question because your discussion of it indicated that it, that it might be uh, possible for additional funds rather than a 1 million total. Is that correct or am I misinterpreting that? Um, I asked uh, the staff if a million dollars was a reasonably sized ask for this, and that's when they indicated that the average uh, award last year was seven hundred and fifty thousand. So I was my approach was just to go in for a one to one match um, on it. Do is there? Um, sense that we could increase that or you might make it flexible enough in a motion that um, you would could pursue uh, funding for a million uh, dollars um, 
with the concept of a million dollars and not make it official that that's the cap. I guess I, I mean, just starting these conversations, there there's such a huge interest in blue carbon and and so forth. I think um, it might be <clears throat> might be a better opportunity. It's it's hard to say in terms of when the spending would have to be completed as well. It has to move quickly and the funds need to be um, moved in 2023 budget cycle. So um, other, uh, Christina, Steve, would you have any recommendation on having uh, not made, perhaps not specifying a dollar amount for the request so that we could keep the conversation open with the Congresswoman's office. That sounds reasonable to me, as long as you're comfortable with that. Um, if you've indicated to, to the Congresswoman's office that you would be asking for a one-to-one -one match with existing state funds, then if, and that's what they're anticipating that it might be difficult to go back and say, actually, we want more, but I don't, I, I you know, I, I would, I would delegate authority to you to make that decision as you see fit, but I think a one-to-one -one match for most of the federal funding for things like, for federal match of these things like that is, is usual and common. Yeah. And I would agree with that. That's what I was trying to say when I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right, um, then do I hear a motion for authorization to proceed um, with the, they're called, um, it's called the Community Project Funding Request. That's so moved. Is there a stipulation on amount or? I'd say that we'll leave that to your discretion to work with her on that. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And um, I have one other, uh, two other requests to make as we get this ball rolling. I, um, again, I'm going to maybe ask Jean if she deems this necessary, but based on my experience, I thought it would be good to have the board um, give me authorization to form a subcommittee for purpose of project identification relative to the near shore research funds. Probably a good idea. And my approach to forming a subcommittee is somewhat informal. We have an excellent um, group of people both on this call right now and people that we have received um, uh, presentations from like Tom Calvinese down in Port Orford with the Oregon Kelp Alliance and um, others I was um, just going to have a rather informal nomination process, ensuring that the right people are at the table, including scientists from the state agencies that we would be working with and perhaps passing funds to, as well as uh, universities, uh, as well as NGOs, conservation organizations, and uh, tribal interests. I would like to keep the committee to around eight people for manageability. So I don't have um, a suite of names to offer for approval, but I trust that we kind of, <laughs> we've got a good working group of folks to, to pull together for this. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I move to uh, grant the chair the authority to form the subcommittee along the lines of what was just described. Second, anyone? I'll second it. Okay, and in favor, say aye. 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 All right, fantastic. And um, 
just a couple minutes left in this agenda item. Um, there's a, one of the bigger items that I don't believe that we need to resolve today um, is how much um, administrative funds we will need to achieve the work as OOST. Um, I think some of that will be a function of how many different projects we're going to be running and uh, the scope of those projects. So I do expect that when we meet again, we will be requesting a percentage of the million dollar allocation to support the contractor or other administrative needs. And I've also asked um, Jean if there are needs from the agency that um, we're able to incorporate that as well. I know it's been very intense on Jean's staff doing the contracts and so forth for the OAH project. So um, Jean? Um, well, you know, we're still working on trying to track it. I mean, really, the supporting the OOST has not cost us a whole lot of staff time up until we had to do those grants and then that. And the other thing that uh, increased the work for us is um, if you do get NOAA funding, if they do it like they do other NOAA grants, you have the agency has to track those costs and then draw down from the grant. So, but I don't, this sounds like maybe they're gonna distribute the whole amount. So I'll need to get more information on that, but that does, in, that does track a little. Um, I think the main thing we've got to make sure and uh, budget for and think about is not as much the staff time as it is DOJ cost and your contracting cost. Because with these grants and all of that, it, you do incur DOJ cost. So Yes, we have learned that. <laughs> <laughs> So I think ensuring that we have a healthy buffer in place yes. because often they're not anticipated. They're things that come up during contracting and questions that come up mm -hmm. with specific applicants. So thank you. All right. Well, I think we'll have a lot to discuss at our next meeting relative to this. And um, also, as you noted, uh, as you probably noticed, um, there was a change in the agenda. We had originally scheduled an update on the Marine Reserves assessment with Dr. Will White and his team. Uh, they gracefully deferred until the July meeting so that we had adequate time to discuss this urgent uh, business. So we will be receiving our um, update on the Marine Reserves assessment at our July meeting yet. So great. Anything else on this topic before we uh, move into the OAH project uh, updates? Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I have asked our um, consultant, Lisa DeBrickier with Creative Resource Strategies. She's been working on contract with OOST since the outset of the OAH funding and has been doing a great job keeping us all tracking and uh, maneuvering DOJ and <laughs> And departmental and other um, and other kinds of the uh, realities of moving a million dollars. So I asked Lisa to give us a high level overview of the projects before we uh, ask our PIs to give us a update on um, what their projects are slated for. So Lisa, thanks, Laura. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here today. Um, I just wanted to put out a couple of slides here and then take you to the website, <clears throat> excuse me, just to talk about some of the process and the results of where we are at now. Just a reminder that it is House Bill 3114 that we've been tracking and following uh, and paying close attention to um, as we've worked with DSL um, to get these contracts out the door. Um, so we ultimately ended up with seven projects. 
Um, the legislation called for eight, um, but projects um, five and six were put together to make one larger project because it made more sense um, for those two projects to come together as one. So the ultimate um, list of projects is seven. They still include all eight concepts that were passed by the Oregon legislature. So we launched our website and I'll share some of that with you uh, in October of last year. Originally that website was intended to be all about the RFP uh, and then it was sort of gonna go away um, as the oost shifted to other things. So we may wanna talk about in the near future of potentially changing the domain name if it's gonna serve some additional outreach functions. But we did release the RFPs uh, in mid-October for projects one through six. The RFP for Project 7 was released in November, early November, and the, we then hosted informational webinars in October and December in a Q&A online session on December 10th. We wanted to give potential applicants as much opportunity as possible to talk with us, to ask questions, to get clarification before they submitted their proposals. Projects one, two, three, six, and seven were due the third week of December. And then we did re-announce projects four and five and had those due on March 14th. And as part of that second outreach, we conducted some targeted outreach to institutions along the West Coast. Those are very scientific, technical projects. Um, and there's only a handful of people that do the kind of work that projects four and five were requesting. So we ended up reaching out to a fairly significant number of people to talk with them in detail about the projects uh, and encourage solicited responses. None of the entities that ultimately submitted proposals for project four and five were given um, any special attention just because we had initially reached out to them. They were all put in the same bucket and all reviewed the same way. We did have five reviewers for all seven of the projects. Uh, they included a representative from Oregon State University, Jack Par Barth, two from ODFW, Karn Braby and Steve Rumrell, one from the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayusla Indians, John Schaefer, and of course, uh, Steve Marks with Pew Charitable Trust. In addition to that, and I do not want to understate this, we also had administrative oversight from Laura, as well as the Department of Land, uh, State Land staff. Um, they've been incredible. Um, they've been helping us dot every I and cross every T with the Department of Justice and with contracting, and we greatly appreciate uh, their efforts to date. Uh, Laura did distribute uh, letters of award and letters of, letters of notice to every entity that applied for grant funding, whether they were uh, a recipient of the grant funding or not. And in addition to that, we did host a couple of phone calls as well. We did put out two news releases, one in February after the initial uh, disbursement or announcement of awards, and then again uh, on April 4th with this final round. And then I want to end this show and just share with you um, a little bit from the website. So what we're really trying to do is breathe life into what the OOST is doing. We think that's really important. And in fact, several of you mentioned that at the start of today's meeting. We also want to be uh, very transparent about what the OOST is doing. Um, and so this website has every bit of detail you could possibly ever want to know about the request for proposal process. It was all transparent throughout um, the entire uh, process that we started uh, um, in the middle of last year. And now we're at the place where we're sharing with the public information about the funded research projects. And so we've got this table of contents at the top of this page that just provides a brief snapshot uh, of each project and then as you scroll down, there's a little bit more. Um, these are kind of bigger snapshots of each of the projects that were funded. We are always going to put the House bill title so that people can track the legislation that was passed with each project. But then we're including the project title, the research team and project partners, the specific objectives, the timeline, and the actual project award. What Lisa, is going to go live? Yep. I, 
think we're still seeing your PowerPoint presentation, and I think you may be scrolling through the website live right now. Yeah, let me see what we've got going on here. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah, while you're checking on that, I just put a link to that latest press release uh, that just went out uh, Monday of this week. So you can link on that. So how does this look now? That looks like a website. All right. <laughs> but it's also really uh, small, but that's okay. Yeah. We don't need to really read the words. I think you're just giving us a uh, kind of an overview there. Looks yeah, great. no worries. So we do, again, list the projects. Uh, we always list the house bill in the specific language used in the house bill, because oftentimes uh, the title of each of the projects was a little bit different. You'll notice at the bottom of every project description, it says for more information on the project, click here. Those links are going to go live in the coming weeks and months as we work with the individual project leads to build out information on their projects, provide updates on the projects as they go through them, um, share information about their equipment launches and all of the cool things that they're doing and the information that they're collecting. Um, and so we'll be building out individual pages of this website, working with the um, PIs in the project research team for each of these projects to share information as they're completed. And so the last thing that I wanted to mention, because this is very important to DSL and the OOST as well, is that it's really important that we get regular updates from each of the research teams. Um, there, these are significant amounts of funding. And so on a very regular basis, we're going to be asking uh, the research uh, PI to fill out a very short form online or through a, a fillable PDF um, that tells us what did you accomplish during this last period of time? What are you going to be doing next? Um, who's been working on this? Are there any changes that you've had to make and why? Have you run into any problems and why? Are there any delays? Um, any anticipated challenges you want to share with the OOST? And then they can provide photos, documents, or other information. Um, so we've got a way that we can track the progress uh, of, uh, of these research teams as they go through their individual projects. So Laura, that's all I had intended to share today, yeah. unless you've got anything else you'd like me to share, or if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, yeah, she really kept things tracking and all of the, and in full disclosure and honesty, all of those letters that went out to the awardees, Lisa writes all of those and just asks me to read them. And she sends like she really did all of that on behalf of Oost with the utmost professionalism and timeliness. So I think it really, um, that kind of um, public uh, facing aspect of our, of our organization is really, it's really helping us quite a bit. Hey, Laura, I might mention too that um, just as an update for the group, we now have signed contracts for projects two three and six and pro, uh, contracts for one and seven are going out this week and the plan is for next week contracts four and five to be completed so by the end of april obviously at the latest hopefully by mid-april all contracts will be out the door signed by both parties um, and will be well underway outstanding great well, if there's no questions for Lisa, I'd love just to get our PIs uh, going on um, their presentations. Is there any quick questions for Lisa on process or, or anything on the presentation? All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, I just, so, oh yes, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, give Lisa a shout out. Um, I participated along, um, with Steve, who's on the call here, and, and others in reviewing RFPs and um, and getting on the phone to spend time walking through them um, and discussing the details of pros and cons of the different proposals. And Lisa did a, a really amazing job of organizing us 
uh, providing us templates and scorecards for reviewing the proposals and going through them. It was just a, it was a, it could have been a very, it could have been a long and arduous uh, process, but Lisa made it, made it, um, made it as easy and as smooth as, as, as it could have been. And I think that we ended up with really good projects. Um, additionally, she provided us opportunities to ask questions of the project proponents and maybe get clarity where, uh, where there was clarity lacking. Um, and so it was just a very enjoyable and I think um, um, effective pro, uh, pro experience. And I just wanted to say thanks to Lisa um, for, for guiding us through that process. And, and I'm excited to see where these projects go. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, well said. All right, well, without further ado, um, our first uh, PI is going to be Dr. Francis Chan, uh, Oregon State University, uh, world-renowned researcher on the topic of ocean acidification and hypoxia. Dr. Chan, do you have a presentation ready for us? I, I do. Are you seeing it now? I do, yes. Okay, now let me just go into presenter mode. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Laura, and um, thank you uh, to the members of the trust. Uh, I, I'm here to talk about project one and two as we, we launched uh, this effort. Um, it's one is on intertidal OAH monitoring and in OA monitoring, and the second is on subtitle monitoring. And I, I'm lumping them together. I want to just for efficiency talk about them. It's in my mind, it's really catalyzing OAH monitoring communications and partnerships uh, in Oregon's marine reserves. And I also want to acknowledge my collaborator, uh, Samantha Hatu Chisholm, who, who is not here today. So, I, I, and I want to just break it down. So the challenge is that for us, uh, Oregon is an epicenter for ocean dissipation and hypoxia. We see this, um, you know, just this past summer, we were uh, featured in the Washington Post and others. Uh, and we've also been long recognized as a place where ocean acidification is having an immediate impact on industry. And, and I, I want to emphasize work here is important with national and international um, significance. Uh, on, on the left, uh, you know, we went from saying there's something really strange about oxygen in our coastal ocean, this shouldn't be, to I think at this point, the, the community, we recognize that the loss of oxygen is a one of the uh, pathways of climate change. And you can see this, this is a, I think, five or 600 page home on the global challenges of ocean deoxygenation. Um, we also see the Oregon efforts really highlighted in things like the, the NOAA uh, Ocean Acidification Research Strategic Plan. And, and I'll say this because George, George Wallace, I won't say this, but I, I, I've heard a program officer at NOAA say that NOAA would not have an OA program if it was not for some of the, the, the work that George and his colleagues Bert, did at in Oregon. So showing that there's a problem and actually there are solutions that are driven by the science was instrumental in making the case for having a, a NOAA OA program. But given how the prominence of Oregon in these national and international conversations, it's, it's, it's kind of surprising that we actually have a limited ability to detect and track the exposure of OAH in our state waters. Now, I'm showing you a, an inventory that we did a few years ago of all of the OEH monitoring assets uh, along the West Coast. And you might say, well, well what, are you, what are you talking about? There's so many dots, so many lines on the map. Um, in actuality, if you were to say, well, what's in the ocean now that are in state waters? Because uh, a lot of these other dots are kind of one-time surveys, uh, one-offs, or they're not actually measuring oxygen or not measuring any parts of the ocean carbon chemistry. Uh, if you were to peel all those other things away, there, there are actually very few observations in the ocean right now that can tell us what's going on with oxygen or carbonate chemistry in our state waters. What does this mean? You know, who, so, so what? We don't have, have a lot of observations. Well, uh, on, on the left, you know, this is, that was, this is a recent article that was kind of highlighting, uh, you know, there's some decisions to be made about how we're going to manage our state waters in terms of um, their exposure to OA and hypoxia, but we actually lack the technical information, those observations that help people make the right decisions. 
And on the right, this is a, a figure that I, I pulled off one of the BOEM presentations around uh, offshore wind development. And, and this is a, a, a heat map of, of Dungeons crab fishing effort. And you can see that there's a lot of crabbing that happens in state waters. And these are waters that we don't actually pay a lot of attention to uh, in uh, ocean monitoring for OAH. And you know, I think we want to do this well. Well, th th this is the recommendation of the OAH Coordinating Council. And you know, one of the key actions is, is have this have the science so that we can uh, understand what's happening. And even though it's it's monitoring, but it, it enables a lot of other things, right? Because we want to figure out like what what should we do about this? What are some options? How, what are we going to communicate? And how do we communicate? And how do we mobilize different agencies in the state uh, around uh, these challenges? And so, and, and I'll be perfectly honest because um, I'm a scientist saying that, you know, we want more uh, observing. Uh, so let's be honest, like what, why might we actually want to detect and track ocean chemistry other than me getting more data to write papers? And I, I'll just offer two uh, perspectives. One is that we're really living on OAH thresholds. This is a, 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 you know, this is what I get when we throw really, you know, expensive instruments in the ocean and, and buy, by pure luck, they survive and we get them back. We see that, and this is actually in, in the Cape of Petra Marine Reserve, that we, we have the season in the summer where uh, dissolved oxygen and uh, partial pressure of CO2, they, they fluctuate, uh, they mirror each other uh, for good reasons, but that we get exposure to hypoxia. We're almost always at the edge of it and sometimes we go way below it. And in terms of the red, which is the PCO2, uh, the red dotted line is ab about for the kind of water we have in terms of temperature, salinity, and alkalinity. You know, what's the threshold for carbonate dissolution is that we, we, we play, we, we go in and out of that carbonate dissolution threshold quite a bit. Um, so we really, our system is living on the threshold between something that we like to something that is uh, going to be problematic for uh, a lot more ma uh, marine organisms in the future. And unfortunately, changes are actually underway. Um, we love upwelling. Upwelling winds is the, the it's the engine that drives a, a productive coast of food webs. But you can have too much of a good thing. And it turns out we've been getting more of this good thing over the past few decades. This is um, upwelling wind stress uh, off Newport, and we've seen and a pattern of has emerged. We're getting stronger and stronger, more intense upwelling winds over our summer now. Well, what does that mean? Well, we found out really, uh, really clearly last summer, because last summer we had the 2021, we had the earliest spring transition. So that transition from the winter weather to these upwelling winds that blow from the north, it flipped, the, the system flips every spring, but the, last year it flipped the earliest on record. And the, the record is only 35 years. That's why it, it could have been longer but it, it, it started really early and it lasted for a really long time. It, we had the second most amount of upwelling winds uh, uh, on record. And as a consequence, this is what the oxygen levels look like. Red is 2021, black is this long-term mean. And we see that starting in um, April, we, the, our ocean moved into hypoxia and it pretty much stayed the same way all the way until October. and, and I had to pull the mooring because I, I, I didn't want to lose it over the winter storms. But for all those months, we had hypoxia sitting on parts of our shelf. And I always say, you know, that's a really long time for a fish to hold its breath. Um, and why do we need a monitoring network? Well, it, it's, and again, you should be always leery of scientists saying that we need more instruments in the water. You know, you have one and it's really fancy expensive. Why do you need one, two, or five, or 10 more. Well, geography really matters. And here's two examples from the marine reserves. These are right uh, coastal within uh, probably two miles of the surf zone. And uh, we see that dissolved oxygen, it's highly variable over time, but that uh, in the north at Cape Falcon, we, we edge, we skirt into hypoxia, but we don't quite get there. Well, in the middle of Oregon and Cape Petra, we just hit it, you know, we hit it for weeks in, in the summer. And you get the same picture of geography that not everywhere is the same from the intertidal pH record that we now have. So that there are hot spots of ocean acidification exposure 
but there are also refuges. And we're actually finding out that these refuges seem to be really persistent um, uh, through time. Oh, oh. And, and, and this is a little more science technical, like why do we need more than one? Because to be honest, redundancy matters. Uh, if we, so the Ocean Observatories Initiative has a mooring in state waters. Um, uh, this is actually from a little further off, but you see that it, it's an outlier. You know, this is a very, very, this is one of the state of the art ocean observing system that we have. But if we didn't have anything else, we would have thought, wow, you know, back in 2020, we were you know, hitting hypoxia in May. But if you, but we also had other instruments out there and it told us, you know, that, that sensor was probably off calibration. So we know what's, what, what is right and what is incorrect. So redundancy does matter. Uh, that said, um, ocean uh, time, so ocean time series observations can be really expensive. That Ocean Observatories Initiative program uh, it's been called, you know, the billion dollar baby for oceanography because, you know, it, it's, it's massive. You know, you're looking at ships that cost upwards of $30,000 a day to service these moorings. Um, so it, time can be quite expensive and, and geography can be quite expensive because if we're going to take vessels to move up and down the state waters to retrieve sensors um, or even to just drive around, uh, uh, you know, that, that's going to incur a lot of costs. So, what did, what did uh, we, we propose? And this is our approach. Um, one is that I, you know, we were taking advantage of the fact that we have some more cost efficient observations out there. So we, we developed technologies through other projects that I think will allow us to have our, our state to have a very cost efficient ocean OAH monitoring program. Uh, we want to kind of change how we communicate the science. We want to take full advantage of the partnerships that we have built and we want to continue to build. And we really want to diversify ocean research. And I'll, I'll kind of walk through what I mean by, by this. So we, we, we've been able to lower the cost of sustained and also distributed ocean observing through time. Um, so starting the left, we, we have a relatively low, relatively, this NASA is you know, low, when, you, when a scientist says low cost, it means, you know, thousands to tens of thousands, not millions, right? Um, so we, we know that we can deploy these sensors very cost effectively using um, small vessels, and we can piggyback a lot of research on. Uh, we've also developed solid state pH sensors that can be mounted on the rocks so that we can use the rocks as a platform for monitoring uh, OA exposure. Uh, and we've also developed technology to uh, allow fishermen to be part of the, the network of observers. So it's, it's a little hard, but there's a, there's a copper end. It uh, looks like a, it looks like a, a, a flashlight, uh, but uh, it's that black tube. That's a dissolved oxygen sensor. Um, it's smart, it's rugged, and it lets fishermen to collect data, you know, just as part of their regular activities. And, and I'll, I want to emphasize that the solid state pH sensor, that was developed because um, we got an ex a, a grant from a, 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 the Education Foundation of America and, and Representative Gomberg met with the program officer to help us convey the importance of doing this work. And because of the legislation that's been passed but in the, or the Oregon legislature, we were able to make a compelling case to NOAA for why they should support additional, and this is a million dollar grant from the federal government to help us develop these dissolved oxygen sensors. So I, I just wanna emphasize that the state investments in time, energy, and also dollars actually have a multiplier effect on how I, as a researcher, my ability to go after external uh, funding. Um, so the second uh, piece was that, that partnership, uh, you know, some of, uh, you know, Dick's here, Charlie's on. Uh, this is how we get away from me having to drive up and down the state in a continuous loop to service pH sensors that we, we work with partners that, know where to, where to deploy it and can actually access the sites. Um, and this is a really powerful model that's actually being replicated, has been replicated uh, in other places. Uh, we also have a partnership with the fleet now. Um, and uh, this is, we've had a two years running and we're gonna continue this again. And I wanna say that the, the partnership is not just about the science, but it's also about the communication because, you know, arming, Dick or, or Charlie, the information to communicate science is invaluable. And 
I know that on, on Friday, Greg Niles is going to take a, a video crew out to talk about you know, his participation in this hypothesis observing network. And we're also going to talk about, we, we also want to communicate ocean change science kind of a different way because I do this, you know, and then, you know, I, I run through this PowerPoint show, you know, I, I try to, you know, wow you with as much graphs and data as possible, but, you know, I'm not sure we're reaching the right people necessarily. So in the, this program, we're going to do two things. We want to have kind of different voices for this presenting the story of ocean change. We've worked on that before with folks like Mark uh, Weigert and, and Al Bazaar. Uh, these are some videos that we've made. So we want to continue that and we want to do it in kind of a TED style talk where we can have events at the coast, but also in Portland and the east side, where we wanna engage people. I don't wanna lose people with droning science. And I, ideally, I'm not the one presenting. I want other people to be presenting to share their perspectives on ocean science in, in a passionate way, in a, in a passionate way. Uh, I should also say, we've, we've had some meetings uh, with Nanu, so they will serve, us, serve up our data so that this information is uh, accessible. Uh, I also want to note that we're going to try to diversify ocean research, and and that is both who participates. So uh, you know, oftentimes we these are great opportunities for us to bring students out to get them get you know, you know, we want them to get the bug right to to do ocean science. But uh, with um, my colleague uh, Dr. Chisholm Hatfield, we're also integrating uh, traditional ecological knowledge scholarship into OH research, and that's to understand. You know, what has been the use of these different places in the ocean? How has changes in, how is changes in exposure likely or not likely to affect access to uh, important ceremonial foods, for example? So that's the, 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 the plan that we have going forward. Uh, we are uh, working hard right now to get everything signed and get the funds in order and get uh, days on the, on the ship. I'll end there, and I, if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, we do have plenty of time for questions, and I'm also I'm putting a link in the chat to a um, great article that came out on an online magazine featuring Dr. Chan's work with the fishing industry, particularly related to Dungeness crabs. So check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, First questions from the Oost board. And if any members of the public have questions, if you would just type your name into the chat, assuming we have time, I'll get to as many um, individual questions as we can. Christina, did you have a question? No, I don't have a question. I just, uh, because the, presentation was so thorough. So thank you for that. That uh, was really interesting to look at the data over time. I have one question um, kind of relevant relative to what Representative Gomberg was saying um, this morning and Senator Anderson about how some of these funds, you know, they could just be one offs. They, it's not a biennial or year after year guaranteed allocation. How did you approach that when thinking about the long-term monitoring effort that you're trying to achieve and what you had an opportunity to do in a, you know, in a one-off situation? Yeah, you know, I think um, the, it, you know, all of these things are kind of um, bootleg, you know, to get something that we can, where we can detect change. No one's ever given me, you know, like, okay, do this for 20 years guaranteed funding. So we're always trying to cobble things and, and make it work. But along the ways, you know, the goal is to, if this information is useful, I want to make it as cost effective as possible so that, you know, we can, you know, even with very small future dollars, keep these observations going. But that said, you know, if, you know, we learn something, we learn something every single year. And I think the, the more important outcome of what we're going to do in the next two years of these observations might be that partnership network, might be that we can communicate. This is what Oregonians are investing energy and time into, and this is what we're finding out about ocean. And I think that's the, the key uh, outcome is that people are listening, people understand, and that that knowledge is accessible. Yeah, 
and and that they they feel like yeah you know i've got a stake in the ocean too yeah it's been great to see the um evolution of the messaging over time from something that was perhaps once considered to be just the realm of pure science and not something the general public would be able to digest or, or um, get engaged in, but particularly through the work of yourself, Dr. Chan and other PIs we're gonna be hearing from, I've really seen it become something that's accessible to, to people and um, to myself <laughs> to be able to, to be able to, um, you know, visualize through the work of creating good visuals and, and simple visuals, you know, how, how this works. So thank you for that. Any questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, I did have a quick question. Uh, thinking back on the partnerships, and it just triggered it when you mentioned about uh, doing this through your partnerships. How did you get the fishermen interested in this? And do they feel like they have an investment in the data that they're uh, collecting because they're deploying those sensors? Yeah, I should say that the, the, that fisherman pro, uh, auction project started because we had a round table with scientists and fishermen. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember distinctly where they said, you know, officials said, you know, we're about blood on the decks, you know, we're not about data. But if there's something that they can do because they were going to see way more than I ever could go out see, there's something they can be doing to help close the uncertainty about, you know, where is the refuge? Where should they go when hypoxic zone hits? Is there a future in the fishery for, for, for them that they were willing to, to work with us? And they said, but make it simple and make sure it doesn't take up all the room in the crab pot so that it, you know, they weren't catching crab. Uh, so it's, uh, it started with the fishermen and we, we, we just co-designed that. Uh, and the, it is, it's interesting because like it, it, we went from only we knew what was happening in the ocean to these sensors, when they come out on deck, they automatically Bluetooth the data to a deck box, it's like a fish finder. So the fisherman sees the first data I, I, before I do. They know more about and immediately about what's happening in the summer than I, than I do. So I, I just been so thankful and impressed by the, the fleet. You know, they're, they're very forward thinking. Um, and, you know, some of our partners, they actually went out just to deploy the sensors. You know, we wanted to make sure that we weren't getting in the way, but it, some of the fishermen actually went out just to, so they would be deploying sensors so that they're collecting data. Well, thank you so much for that uh, presentation, Dr. Chan, appreciate it. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, get a couple minute jump start on our next presenter. You never know when things are gonna go long. So <laughs> thank you again. Uh, Dr. Bob Cowan is our next presenter and our, are you on the, all right now. I can get us started. Bob should be Hi. coming back soon. Okay. Um, hang on, let me share my screen. Great. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, Dr. Cowan is, of course, the director of the Hatfield Marine Science Center at OSU. And Cinnamon Moffat, thank you for being here, research program manager. Looking forward to hearing your talk. Hang on, let me make sure I get the right screen up. <laughs> and of course it doesn't want to do it now. That's so fun. <laughs> that looks good, Cinnamon. Yeah, but now you just see my, you don't see my, um, uh, you still see the notes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I can't have that. I put all kinds of crazy things in my notes, like you <laughs> could like, and then it's on the screen for everyone to read. That's not fun. So Bob, maybe you can start us off just a little bit. Well, sure. Um, and I apologize that I had to step out to another meeting. So um, I'm fortunate that I made it back here right now. But um, 
Yeah, so first of all, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity that we have. Um, I think I know many of you, uh, but for those I don't, I'm Bob Cowan. Um, I'm uh, the now Associate Vice President for Research and Operations at Hatfield Marine Science Center. Same sort of role, different title. Um, and been part of what we've been trying to do is to expand some of our research capabilities and research support capabilities at Hatfield. Um, the, the opportunity has come up both in the timing of this particular call for research and monitoring support and work that we are taking underway with at Hatfield in repairing uh, and completely replacing part of our, the core part of our seawater system uh, the causeway, which goes out into the bay, uh, pumps water and supplies it to the rest of the um, uh, laboratories. So tied to that, um, and in the past, and and cinnamon, I'm you're still working on it, so I don't want to get too far ahead. Of <laughs> I am here. still working and, on it. I don't know what the issue is with what's going on on my computer. Um, but as as part of this uh, causeway and and the the pump house in the past. We have been uh, supporting various monitors, uh, everything from temperature and salinity and sea level height. Uh, and as funding would allow uh, and partnerships, um, we have, there we go, that'll work. Um, we have been able to put in different uh, sensors that have relevance to environmental monitoring not only of some of our local scientists, but as part of uh, monitoring from a more regional perspective. And so what we've put together here uh, with this opportunity is a more coordinated uh, system, uh, brought in some more partners, we're leveraging some of the opportunities that we have uh, also in a, uh, associated with the, the new Gladys Valley Marine Studies Building and the Innovation Lab. Uh, and it's enabled us to put together this program that I think will be sustained for a, a much longer time period because uh, uh, this grant helps us get the, the core pieces in place, but we have the infrastructure to, to continue it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cinnamon to introduce herself for a second. Hi, everyone. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the research program manager. And I'm a little embarrassed because I help everybody do this all the time. And now I can't make it work <laughs> on my screen. So I apologize. So if you all will work with me, we'll, we'll kind of uh, work through it. But I just want to say Francis set us up really well to talk about the work that we're doing here. Um, and I just want to share this long term robust climate monitoring station that Hatfield is working on, as Bob was saying, um, and just kind of walk you through kind of our proposal and what we are hoping to do um, along these lines. Um, and so one of the things that Hatfield has done is since the early 2000s, we've had monitoring for um, OAH at the Hatfield campus, but because they were either short-term projects uh, by university professors or through um, agencies that weren't necessarily focused on the public accessibility of that particular data. Uh, Francis talked about regional gaps. What we were struggling with were temporal gaps. So we would have a monitoring program that would be really great, and then we would lose funding for it, and we wouldn't have the long-term support. And so the idea that we really wanted to focus on with the funding on with uh, this particular grant in project three was creating something that was this really stable long term monitoring that had a lot of long term support um, so that we, we wouldn't have these kind of gaps. So Bob, I'm going to hand this one back yep. to you. So one other aspect of it is while we're we're located in Yaquina Bay, central uh, Oregon coast. Hatfield is one of many marine labs along the coast. Um, and what's shown here is a, just a map of, of US marine labs that, that all participate in, in a, a group called the Western Association of Marine Laboratories. And that's a regional group. There are three regional groups of the larger NAML, um, National Association of Marine Labs. So there are about 125 of these in total, about um, 27 or so on the West Coast. 
And efforts are underway within these marine labs to try to build a more coherent network of sensors for monitoring, particularly with regard to um, OAH. Uh, and uh, some of the steps that these different labs have run into or the challenges they've run into, of course, is funding. Uh, and then there's also funding. And um, then there's the, the quality, if you actually find some funds, can you get research quality sensors? Are they gonna be useful to the research um, community as well as the, the public community? And, and so some uh, opportunities are coming forward uh, for planning from federal funds like the National Science Foundation to build networks of these. But we have with this particular uh, source of funding right now and, and our ability to leverage what's going on with our um, causeway building, uh, an opportunity to get this really high quality um, sensors in place for long-term monitoring as to be sort of an anchor point for this larger network that we're, we're hoping these communities, these different marine labs can do. So just to dive in a little bit deeper on what we're talking about and where we're thinking about having these sensors, um, as Bob was saying, we were really fortunate this fall uh, to get some support from the university to replace our pier and groin at Hatfield, which is where our pump house sits. Um, part of that was just that that pier has been deteriorating and we were starting to see a separation of the water coming, the piping coming from the pump house going into our facility. And so um, we got the funds to basically replace the pier and the pump house. And so in doing that, we were thinking about how we wanted to restructure access in the space that we use in the pump house to do the monitoring that we've been doing historically. And so EPA has had a a particular instrument out into the pump house, but it was in the middle of the pump house. You could only access it if you walk through the pump house. Um, and so we really wanted to think about that space a little bit differently. And so this is what we're going to have in our remodel. Um, and so on this side, you can see kind of that causeway and pier leading out to a new pump house. And in that new pump house, we'll actually have a separate room that will be our climate monitoring station that has access um, through a separate door and does not access our core pumping, which we pump about a million gallons of seawater into Hatfield's campus every day. And so we wanted to kind of separate those uses a little bit. Um, and what we wanted to do was really think about, um, kind of as Francis was talking about, what instruments did we need in order to do what we wanted to do? What was the standard up and down the coast with other folks that were working on these particular issues? What instruments were they using? Um, and we wanted to build from that. The other thing that we really wanted to focus on is, uh, as uh, Francis said, um, the same idea of making sure that we had duplicate instruments. One, to make sure that the instruments we were able to exchange and not lose data, but also so that we can compare them one against the other. And so what we were able to do is we got together with a, um, did a bunch of interviews. We also pulled together a group of folks at our annual research summit and talked about what are the instruments that we need. And so this is a list of instruments that we will have out there. The ones that are starred have been donated. And so we haven't even used the funds that came from this particular grant to pay for those, which is great because as Francis said, some of these are pretty expensive. Not only that, but the donated ones from Seabird, they are donating two of them. So we'll always have one in backup so that when we need to take one offline to do a replacement, we'll be able to instantly put that other one back online. So this really adds to our long-term stable um, climate monitoring ability, focusing first on this OAH a um, component. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into all the back end. The idea here, though, is not only did we need the instruments, we needed all the back end IT to be robust, to be stable, to have data that was um, collected and stored, and then passed out to our different users in a way that was accessible to them. And the other piece of this is we really wanted the the work that we were doing to be modular so that we could add or change things as new issues came forward. And so we're starting with the OHA instruments. Um, it'll be the start of it. And then hopefully we'll be able to build out from there. Um, we're working with the university's um, 
uh, IT to help us build this back end infrastructure. So it's not really sexy because you won't see any of it, um, but it really allows us to have a really stable back end that um, the instruments are collecting the data, the data is pulled together in a usable format. Um, it is then uh, shared out to a couple of our different users, which we're going to dig into here just a little bit more. So in addition to those core instruments that I was talking about, the other thing that became an important thing for a lot of the users that we were talking about um, is this idea of a test berth, a place where we could put instruments in and compare it to these more regulatory standard instruments that we know. So that way, uh, things that are being developed um, can be compared to a known standard. And part of that came from this added capacity at Hatfield, where we have um, this new prototyping lab um, called the Innovation Lab, where we are working with the engineers um, on main campus to really start to build some of our capacity here. And so we wanted to make sure that as we were developing a space out there, we were able to uh, give students a place to put instruments in the water, to give other researchers a place to put in instruments. And in fact, I just got approached uh, for the new Tawny, the research vessel that will be coming in. There's some instrumentation they're developing, and they wanted exactly this, a place to compare their new instrument that they're going to put out on the research boat with instrumentation that we will have in place um, and compare that at a one-to-one -one basis. So this test berth is a really new and exciting component to what we'll be able to offer. The other thing that we spent some time with is to really understand our users for this data and then to figure out how they needed to receive the information that we are presenting. As Francis was saying earlier, um, it's not just about raw numbers or necessarily graphs. Each of these different users have a different need and possibly a different format in which they need to be able to receive that data. So we wanted to make sure that when we were developing this project, we were targeting our end users and being able to present the data in a way that was useful for them. To do that, <laughs> just like Francis said, it's about partnerships. Um, a lot of this stuff is complicated and we can't do it all by ourselves. And so we are continuing to work with EPA to be able to monitor um, and to be able to maintain the instruments that are in the water. As we were saying, we're developing a much stronger relationship with the university's IT department to be able to help us maintain and establish that back end infrastructure. We're also um, working with a couple other groups that we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail to be able to help us transfer that data out. Um, and then we've built a brand new partnership with Seabird, which is one of the uh, local instrumentation groups uh, is out of Philomath that's able to put uh, some of the instruments in the water and have that really strong partnership with them as we go forward. So just like Francis was saying, we're also going to be partnering with NNUS to be able to live stream our data on a very stable data visualization platform. This is one that many of the different uh, groups that are doing OHA work are presenting their data on, and so we'll be a part of that platform. So we're excited to, and we were presenting on OHA data on NNUS in the past. It's just that we weren't able to keep that going, and so we're reestablishing this relationship. The other component of this grant, though, is about working with our visitor center here at Hatfield to be able to engage the public in this data. And so we are really trying to increase the conversation in the, with the public around climate change and ocean acidification issues, not only in the ocean, but in the estuaries. Um, and we are working with the visitor center staff and Sean Rowe, researcher Sean Rowe, to figure out how the public can interact with the way that they see data. So improving the public's data literacy um, through this data visualization. So our plan is, is to have the data that is collected at those instruments transferred into the visitor center and have a display that works around it where this, uh, the visitors can see the different data, but it might be interpreted in a different way than a series of graphs or those kind of things, depending on what they need. So it might be a color bar, um, those kind of things, but we're working on developing that at this time. Uh, the other thing that is a little bit different for us is that we are taking this instrumentation idea and putting it into the mission of Hatfield. So just like our seawater system is kind of core infrastructure for Hatfield, this climate monitoring system is going to become core infrastructure for Hatfield going forward. And so uh, it's really using this one-time 
chunk of money to help us get that started, and then we'll be able to uh, continue it and keep it moving forward in this way. So in the grant, we talked about some uh, milestones and <laughs> we're already seeing that we have some supply chain issues. And so we expect it'll probably take us the entire three years to get through all of the pieces of this complicated project between getting the instruments into the water, getting them calibrated, uh, streaming the data in a way that we're happy with and working with a visitor center to present that information as we go forward. And I moved a little quick because I didn't have my notes, but I'm going to move to questions and maybe we'll just have a discussion about uh, these kind of things and, and I can fill in any gaps that I might have missed. Great, thank you. Um, do we have questions from our board? Well, I have one question, but I'm, I might have to ask you to put your screen back up if you could, <laughs> Cinnamon. You're just messing I, with me now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm going to challenge your IT skills here. I think it was your slide number 14. What? What are we looking at there? <laughs> Isn't that impressive? Um, yeah, so some of the pictures on this particular slideshow aren't necessarily of the climate monitoring station, but of the development of that new um, uh, pump house. And so these are our new pumps that'll be bringing water up into the uh, Hatfield. And so they are impressive to look at. And so I just wanted to share a photo of them. Million gallons a day. A million gallons Impressive. of seawater a day. Um, yeah, so this the capacity of these are a little bit bigger. That means that we could pull on a shorter window. So because we're located in the estuary, we can't pull 24 hours a day because we want good quality seawater. So we have to pull around high tide. And so giving these pumps um, a little higher capacity means that we can pull on a, a slightly narrower window and get um, more stable seawater. Great. Madam Chair, I have a quick question. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Cinnamon. Um, I just had a question about um, this, this project relative to others you may know about in, in other regions like uh, Puget Sound or Columbia River or San Francisco or Humboldt Bay or, um, and whether the data that we'll be collecting here in, um, at, at the pump house can be compared to um, discussed within the context of, you know, OAH dynamics across the West Coast. So just thinking about uh, with respect to California current ecosystem sort of discussions, like how this information, it, it, will this kind of be apples to apples with some other monitoring efforts or is it different data? Or just, uh, just thinking about the tran translatability of this data relative to where similar efforts might be underway on the West Coast. Bob, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, in, in some cases, it, it's a really good question because it the, the location of the laboratory and the, the type of water that they're bringing in. So in some cases uh, where it's a little more estrin uh, laboratories, there will be apple to apple. Sometimes it's going to be apple to pear. Um, yeah. But uh, for larger regional signals, um, you know, it's our water is kind of right at the interface between coastal and estuarine uh, impacts. So it's, um, but our, our, our measurements will be going through a full tidal cycle. So we can measure the coastal waters for a while, and then we'll be measuring um, estuarine waters when it's on the, the outward flow. Uh, so we'll have some applicability to both. But this is exactly the type of questioning that the different marine labs up and down the coast are talking about. The San Francisco, there's one inside the bay at Tiburon. Um, there's um, uh, the Davis lab that's right on the coast, uh, but it's pulling its water in from a little little tiny inlet. So it's a little more applicable to us, though it doesn't have as much of an estuarine influence. It's got that coastal. Um, uh, Friday Harbor is inland water. Uh, so yeah, it's a great question. And we're trying to, to look at how at what levels we can compare um, these these different signals, as well as across the, the equipment we're using. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, I might have been a little confusing by when we're pulling seawater and when we'll be monitoring, but we'll be monitoring 24 hours a day. So yeah, we'll get this really interesting signal um, between the tidal exchanges. I have a question. Um, noticing that you have a significant component around public outreach with this project, particularly using the visitor center to um, do um, an exhibit and interpretation. One of the projects that the OOST funded is around messaging, um, and you probably saw that RFP up, and it was one of the later ones to get uh, awarded. But do you see any interaction there with your project and another OOST project to maybe learn from what they're going to be doing as you're developing your interpretation? Yeah, I would love to. And it's just about timing. Um, you know, if, if when we're able to develop our messaging and really think about how we want to present the data, uh, I would love to work with that outreach individual uh, group to see, you know, what is the way we want to frame that. Um, I didn't put it directly into the application because I wasn't sure who that was going to be in the timing of those things. But yeah, I agree. It would be great to, to kind of amplify their message through our exhibit if possible. Yeah, fantastic. We'd love to facilitate that on our end uh, from Oos for any of the PIs that are working. And um, one second, Christine, let me just also notice really quick that the some of the other projects that we'll be getting updates on, what you're seeing today is some of the very basic research uh, monitoring, but in addition to messaging, there was also a project around developing best management practices, so more applied realm. So if there are ways that we can link up um, people working on these projects, we'd love to do so. Uh, yeah, Christine, we'd appreciate have, that as well. Yeah, Christine? Yeah, I had uh, kind of curiosity and, and I might've missed this. Uh, are you, besides the chemical monitoring, are you, considering any biological um, testing using some of genetic tools or any kinds of things like that that might be applicable to characterizing your systems? Um, we're starting with the chemical monitoring, but like I was saying, we are creating the back end so that it's modular and we can add other instruments when it becomes available to us. The other thing that we're hoping to package is other sampling that we're already doing. Um, it's not so much about in water, but we are doing some air quality monitoring right now, and we have a long standing weather station at Hatfield. We'd like to bring that data set together um, because a lot of those things are interconnected and will tell a different story if we're linking it. And so that's kind of the back end components of bringing all those things together. But um, at this point, it's primarily focusing on the chemistry for the instruments that we have. If I could add to that, there, there are efforts and even some projects um, that uh, tied to Simmers and with our iLab to develop a, um, a sampler for uh, eDNA. And the eDNA techniques certainly are um, established at, at Hatfield with some of our, our genomics scientists. And that idea, that, that whole question of, of biological sampling is something that is uh, resonating across these, these different marine labs. And, and one of the planning projects that we have in mind is with NSF to fund a, um, a development plan for eDNA sampling uh, along the uh, regions. There's also um, uh, sensors for chlorophyll and, and different um, uh, constituents of, of uh, primary productivity and, and bacterial growth. So there, there are, we don't have the, you know, the detailed planning for that yet, but that's something that is certainly uh, coming down the line. Yeah, it's certainly an emerging area of interest and uh, very valuable. With that in mind, we designed the um, structure within the climate monitoring station to be able to put instruments into the water, but also to have water flowing through the room so that we can have desktop um, instruments, one of them being a, a cyber flow bot, um, which basically takes 
images of what is in the water. Um, it just wasn't, we weren't capable, we weren't able to, to make that happen in this particular package, but um, it is part of the long-term plan. Wow, I just got to say cyber flow. Oh, I misspelled flowbot. Cyber flowbot. That's got to be my favorite word of the day today. We can work that into our future grant uh, requests. No doubt we'll be uh, successful. I love that. <laughs> it's, yeah, also, it would be great. Reminder that if anyone in the general public has questions for our presenters, please type your name in the chat and uh, we have, uh, we're, we're doing okay on time. I am recognizing that I just blew right past the break on the agenda, which was scheduled for 1.30. Um, yeah, far be it from me to keep a schedule. So we will take a, a break, but uh, before we do, are there any additional questions for uh, Dr. Cowan or Cinnamon Moffat? All right, great. Dr. Waldbesser, you'll have us all refreshed. Um, I'm gonna recommend we come back at five after and we'll get a jump start um, on our next presenter. Thank you. All right. Let's see, we've got our Make sure we've got our board members reconvened here. I see Mr. Marks, Senator Anderson, Christine Moffitt, very good. And Christina is here, outstanding. Great. All right, while well, we have our third and final presenter for today, uh, Christine asking about monitoring. I think Dr. Waldbusser will have a thing or two to say about that. That is the nature of his project. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Laura. I want to thank the entire um, OST for supporting this work and um, everybody for hanging in there for the day. So let me see if I can't make this work. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Great. Yep, yeah, looks great. So, okay, so um, I'm George Wallbuster. I've been um, <clears throat> thinking about oysters and acidification and estuaries and acidification twice. I think I've been thinking about acidification a lot um, for quite a while. And so um, I want to thank Francis for the shout out before about the hatchery work. And uh, we've done with my colleague Burke Hales as well and lots of others. And I'm going to uh, transition to talk a little bit about Olympia oysters. We've done some work on Olympia oyster larvae previously. Um, but the, the project that you all are supporting is to now look at Olympia oysters in the Uquina estuary and use a time for space type approach. And so I'll describe what that uh, means in a minute. So, and I just want to also acknowledge Sea Grant it has been supporting work we've been doing. And so this work actually, the support now helps to continue um, the work and the measurements in Uquina Bay. We've been mostly focusing on Pacific oysters previously. And as Francis said, we're always trying to figure out ways to cobble and, and, and you know, put these things together. Um, and the other cool thing I just sort of uh, observed is we started with Francis kind of out in the coastal offshore intertidal, and now, you know, we're sort of moving up the estuary. So we're effectively moving from Hatfield up the estuary in, in this work here where uh, oysters grow. So just really briefly outline for the talk, um, I'll do a little brief introduction. I'm not going to spend much time talking about acidification, but an aspect or two in estuaries, the study system as a whole. I'm going to share some of the data we've been collecting in Uquina because I think it really provides a good foundation. And then um, again, as Francis and others noted, we're, you know, the project has technically started, but we're still getting through the paperwork aspects now. And so um, we're, we're eager to get going and, um, and we've gotten some steps and measures already in place. So 
So what I want to say is, um, you know, acidification in estuaries, it's, it's not gradual in these dynamic systems, right? We think about the ocean and climate change as being this gentle march towards some change. But in systems, a lot of variability, we see a lot of um, uh, changes that occur on shorter timescales and thresholds, as, as Francis mentioned and showed some data earlier, that we can cross these thresholds far earlier than we think about we, we think about global averages. And my perspective is always that the organisms we're interested in don't experience those global averages. They experience local conditions and that and all that variability. <clears throat> Ocean acidification isn't the only variable that changes with climate change, right? And that includes, uh, with, even within ocean acidification, a multitude of various carbon parameters. Um, and so that we understand from work we've done previously that some parts of carbonate chemistry affect the physiology of, of oysters and oyster larvae, for example, in different ways. Um, <clears throat> nor is acidification always the most imminent threat. And I think we're going to see some of that, that some changes in things like temperature might become more important in a, in a more immediate horizon. And we don't understand the full potential impacts, right? We've done a lot of laboratory work. Um, understanding in, in isolated conditions or maybe with one or two other things. Um, but it's hard to really get a measure of how these variables and these uh, stressors impact the organisms. And uh, this is, I think, a really important point. Even if we stop our carbon emissions today, right, our system and the upwelling system has essentially anthropogenic carbon that's been pumped into it effectively, that we've got another couple decades of gradual change and background increase in CO2 that's going to happen. So <clears throat> this is some work a, a former student of mine, Steve Pichella, who works over at the EPA, uh, had done as part of his dissertation work. And, and just to sort of give you a sense of this, this is sort of thinking about estuaries. And Steve did this work up in uh, Puget Sound in the Snohomish uh, Basin and <clears throat> did a, a series of observational measurements and some modeling to effectively uh, look at the diurnal variability. So, so these three panels represent sort of a, a pre-industrial condition where we've removed the anthropogenic carbon, the sort of current time frame when the work was done, and then a projection forward based on the IPCC projections of CO2. And the key thing is that in these highly variable systems that the range actually changes, right? It's not just that the average condition has changed, but the range of conditions. So the very worst conditions actually in, in what Steve demonstrated <clears throat> was that the very worst conditions change twice as fast as the average. And so that's why some of these dynamic systems like estuaries, we've got to be really uh, vigilant about and to understand how these things are going to change. Because it's, as Francis said, the same principle applies to these upwelling zones on our coast. As we move inland and inshore and up the estuary, the buffering capacity, the ability to absorb these CO2 increases diminishes with time. <clears throat> uh, so let me move forward to this one. So this, I think, you know, one of the things that are really interesting about Olympia oysters is, is they have a very different life history than we often think about when we think about, sort of many people think about traditional or, or the, the sort of um, hallmarks of the aquaculture industry, which is the Pacific oyster. And so, so the hatchery work we've done, you know, looked at these dynamics in this short window of time when they first make a shell and exposure in this very brief window can create these very dramatic outcomes in terms of larval production. What we have found is that the Olympia oyster has as much slower growth rate as the larvae. It takes a much longer time to develop and it has these other life history attributes that actually appear to make it quite resilient to acidification in the larval stage. And so these are just graphs from work we've done. Pacific oyster larvae, this is showing how many develop normally and the size of the shell in the first 48 hours um, under different exposures of saturation state. And this is a measure of corrosivity of water. It's effectively how uh, stable the water is for the mineral that the oysters make their shell out of. And so you can envision this as, as going to the right on the graph being less CO2 or better conditions. And so as we get closer or higher CO2 or that threshold that Francis noted about dissolution, you can see we start to have these real big impacts in the Olympia oysters, we, we actually see almost no effect, and they actually almost look worse sometimes when we, when we lower the CO2 and we saw no effect on shell. 
we've tied this, we think, to effectively the slow shell building. And I could go on and on about that, but we don't want to uh, spend the time there. So, um, so it's not to say that there aren't impacts on oyster, on Olympia oysters. Um, and this, this is work from uh, Annalise Hediger, who did a lot of really great work on uh, larval and juvenile um, Olympia oysters. And the work I showed you just before is really on that first window of time. And this work that Annalise has, has done is sort of spans that out to the entire larval period and the juvenile stage. Um, and so, um, so what this shows is on, on sort of acute impacts are not as prevalent with the Olympia oyster, but we do see these sorts of impacts. And these things can translate into population levels and long-term growth effects, which haven't really been explored very much. The kind of neat thing about Olympia oysters is they're brooding. So the females actually retain the eggs and they filter sperm out of the water and there's actually internal fertilization and the, and the larvae develop internally. And in doing the work on those early larval stages, we had to actually figure out what the effect of brooding was, if there was any. And, and something that was incredibly fascinating was that we found that the larvae, if the eggs are extracted after fertilization in Olympia oysters, they could develop just fine. There was no difference. There's no physiological benefit is what we could see from that brooding. The other things we know about Olympia oysters relative to a lot of the other common uh, oysters in aquaculture and other settings like Eastern oysters is that they have lar much larger eggs. So they're putting a lot more energy and maternal investment into their offspring, which ultimately translates to fewer offspring uh, relative to Chrysostria species. They have this lower development and calcification. And as I said, they do show some sensitivity to OH. It's not at this really acute larval stage. So what is space for time studies? This is really is the question is getting outside of the lab under these very controlled conditions. Can we, can we use different places that have different chemistry conditions to simulate experiences that they may see in the future um, without having the constraints of growing these things in a laboratory? Larvae are fairly easy to work with, but adult oysters require a tremendous amount of food to grow well. And a lot of experiments can be played by the fact of just the animal husbandry side of trying to keep things in a condition where they actually have some prevalent or prevalence or um, sim simul they're similar to how they would grow in the field, but it's hard to sometimes be able to recreate these conditions. So, um, Here's one example of this. This is work that's been done for, for quite a while. It, um, these are from Papua New Guinea. These are images of um, coral reef ecosystem near a, a undersea uh, CO2 vent, sort of vents where CO2 come out of the earth, ocean floor. And <clears throat> here in Italy and other places, there's been a lot of work that demonstrate how the biodiversity changes, the, the number of calcifiers, and so as you get closer to the CO2 vents, you see these changes in community and they sort of represent um, future conditions. So, <clears throat> so that's effectively what a time space for time or time for space type experiment is, is you use natural gradients to try to simulate future conditions. And fortunately, we see that in many estuaries. So here is the Yukuna Bay. You're all mostly familiar with this. Um, <clears throat> so Francis is talking about systems out here offshore and, and down the coast quite a bit. We just looked at um, the, the really cool work that Bob and Cinnamon are going to implement here at Hatfield. And then for the past several years, we've been working throughout the Aquina all the way up to Cannon Quarry up here and taking measurements <clears throat> and different parameters, a lot of temperature and salinity um, or connectivity measurements throughout here. We've had uh, uh, oysters growing in a number of sites through here to measure specific oyster growth. We've done shell dissolution experiments. We've got a CO2 sensor now deployed at Oregon Oyster Farm in the past six weeks or so. Um, and so I'll show you some of that data in a minute, but this gradient throughout the estuary provides essentially a natural laboratory in some way that we can then assess how growth occurs. And there's a number of assumptions that go along with that. And it, need to monitor a number of different variables as well. <clears throat> so the work we've done so far throughout the day, uh, some of, much of this started back in 2018 actually, and then and was sort of unfunded at the time. And then we, we secured some Sea Grant money to, to, to continue the work through the last couple of years, was we actually started with just looking at oyster shell dissolution rate and talking about biological monitoring 
just looking at how shells, how long they persist in the environment. We've gotten continuous salinity and temperature data at a number of sites. We've been doing discrete CO2 samples throughout the estuary. <clears throat> we had a season of Pacific oyster growth rates that I had undergrad student work on, some nutrient samples. The really important thing we've been looking at a lot is particulate samples or the food, right? The amount of food that's there is really important for growth. Uh, we've been doing some now spatial surveys. We'll continue those of those environmental variables. Um, and the, the Sea Grant work was, uh, there's a co-PI in that work, Jim Lerzak, who's a physical oceanography. And so we actually now have some really great current profiling throughout the Aquina to look at the, the current mixing and some of the impacts of, of currents coming from the side sloughs and tide flats. And then I mentioned we've got continuous pH data uh, at the Oregon Oyster Farm now. So just this, I wanted to show you a little bit of this data just because of some of the seasonality and, and sort of uh, things that I think are really intriguing about it. This is uh, a year's worth of temperature data spanning from Hatfield all the way up to Cannon Quarry. The warmer uh, values are closer to the ocean. So the red here is Hatfield and this blue line is Cannon Quarry. And so we have periods of time, right, where sensors go out or need service and so on. But what you'll see is we get this periodic you know, signal that we expect in summertime it's warm and the wintertime it's cold. But we, and, and the temperature variation through the estuary compresses in the wintertime. But we even see differences where the colder water, and again, none of this should be shocking in itself, right? The, in the wintertime, the watersheds and snow melt up in the, in the uh, Coast Range Mountains are making the water colder up the Cannon Quarry and further up the estuary, and it's warmer. And then in the summertime, we get upwelling and you can see some of these reversals as well, <clears throat> but the water is cooler at Hatfield and much, much warmer up, up the estuary. Um, we have salinity data as well. We're still doing a lot of quality control on that, um, but you, know, you see similar patterns and you see the freshwater signals and so on. But I'll show you some of the potential uses of that that we can do with, with making the inorganic carbon measurements. Um, and then I also wanted to note one of the, the neat things coming out of some of this work is a graduate PhD student in our college, Margaret Conley, who's working with Jim Lerzak, is actually developing a thermal model of Equina Bay that will be able to look at a full heat budget throughout the bay that's somewhat spatially explicit and then project future temperature effects on that and see where we expect to see temperature changes both seasonally um, and spatially throughout the bay. <clears throat> So um, here's some of the, the data we've collected previously. These are the discrete samples uh, through the estuary. Our three sites that we started with back in 2018, these, these represent about two dozen samples at each site or so. Uh, and these are called box and whisker plots. We just kind of show you an average and a spread of the data. Um, <clears throat> and so what you'll notice is at half field, you know, we see some bad conditions, right? But this general increase as we go up the estuary in CO2 concentration and the range also increases as we go up the estuary. So um, part of that is the respiration. So all the uh, organic matter coming out of the, the watershed, the leaves, everything that washes in from land, gets a lot of that gets respired in the rivers. Um, and then the other aspect is that we have less buffering capacity. The, the more fresh the water, the less alkalinity, the less the system is able to buffer or um, resist change in, in these carbon parameters in relation to CO2. And so one of the things we've been able to do with, with some of this monitoring data is look at some simple relationships. And these are things we sort of expect to happen, but we didn't really have these numbers in place. And so you're looking at salinity. And so this is the salinity of our discrete samples and the total alkalinity or the buffering capacity. And then I've color coded these based on just binning of the CO2 concentration. So dark red colors are really high CO2, upwards of almost 2,000 um, parts per million. And the cool blue colors are down atmospheric or lower. <clears throat> so one aspect of this that becomes really useful for monitoring, connecting with some of the work uh, Bob and Cinnamon are doing is being able to use this to fill in some of the data gaps and be able to calculate the carbonate chemistry system because we can make measurements on things like pH and pCO2, but to get at aspects like saturation state, we need to have two parameters that we can have independently. So this is one approach to do that. Um, this also just indicates that uh, as we sort of knew to some degree that our coastal rivers are poorly buffered. 
So more changes in freshwater delivery is going to change the carbonate chemistry throughout the estuary and what and things like oysters experience. Um, so these are um, a couple of uh, sets of the samples we've taken through Yukuna Bay. Um, just to orient you, this is sort of towards the mouth. Half the is sort of up here. Sally's Bend, Idaho Flats area. Um, <clears throat> and these are two different dates that were within a couple of weeks of each other at different tidal regimes. And it's about a difference of a, a 1.5 meter tidal regime. So um, on August 19th, we had a relatively small tidal range. And on the 25th, we had a much larger tidal range. And particularly what you'll notice is down near the mouth of the bay, that you're seeing this relatively bigger um, CO2 signal. Just to point out here, the really dark blue colors get below atmospheric CO2, 400s right here in blue, and 1400 is in this yellow color. In both cases, as you go up the estuary, you see these increases in the CO2 concentration. This is right about where blue, the oyster fork and oyster farm is. Some differences in the timing and tides here we have to account for, but there's a there's going to be, and we're seeing a signal from a lot of these side channels and parts of Equina that contribute to the, the CO2 chemistry and what an organism actually experiences that's living out there. Um, and some of the interests we've had for quite a while is how does the timing of tide and daylight affect some of these CO2 signals? And we know that there are decadal shifts and how that happened, and that might exasperate or mitigate some of this, the acidification effect in the estuary. This was, uh, so you guys are helping to fund uh, putting a, a actual flow through system on our small boat. The, this was sort of the Oregon way of duct tape and, and rope and sort of various cobbling things together. So we hung a small bilge pump off the side of the boat, secured it with a galvanized pipe and a bunch of uh, line. And we're able to go out here and collect GPS data at the same time. And so this is just showing on this August 19th date what these signal, the signal looks like. And you know, I have a tendency at first to overinterpret, but you can see the slightly uh, higher CO2 signal along the edge of the flat relative to the middle of the channel. <clears throat> What's really fascinating to me is again, these side flues when they come down the estuary or up the estuary here, and you can see this is over the course of about an hour, you can see the variance we're seeing from about 600 all the way up to 1100 uh, parts per million of CO2. And again, the oyster farm sitting right about here, and just even across the channel here, just seeing this difference between um, on this side, on the south side and the north side of the channel, Jim's still working up the flow and profiling data, which we collected in, in conjunction with this. And I think this just has to do with the way the water's mixing in there and the tide. So, so we'll be able to sort of really get a better sense of the variability in what these organisms are experiencing, uh, both spatially and temporally continuing this work and understanding fundamentally how the Olympia oysters are responding to this. Um, <clears throat> so uh, getting to some of the biological measurements we've made, this is just our dissolution rates for uh, both Olympia oyster shell and Pacific oyster shell. And what I've done is just take our discrete data and these are standard errors plotted on here. So this is furthest upriver site of Paddle Park, which is well above where the oyster farm is. This was at the oyster farm at the Halffield Marine Science Center. And, and what you'll notice here is again, this sort of um, somewhat predictable, but interesting relationship, right? We get higher dissolution as we get undersaturated. This is that magic number here, about one. The thing that was striking to me when we first looked at this data um, was the fact that the Olympia oyster shells actually had higher dissolution rates. These are all standardized to the mass of the shell, but this was a little bit striking because we knew that they live in these systems. They have this sort of predisposition to being in sometimes upwelling zones. So it was a little uh, sort of shocking in a sense that we saw this kind of difference. And, and again, these are really close up here, but they are statistically different even at these different sites. So, so we've got some more work to do and we're trying to figure out mechanisms for this, but I think it's really fascinating thinking about Olympia oysters. Um, this is just our Pacific oyster growth. Again, I know I'm sort of uh, beating you guys to death, hopefully not too bad with the data here, but um, again, we're, this is effectively what we're gonna try to be doing with the Olympia oysters and a few more sites um, across those three locations. These are just sizes and shell area we collected with um, photographic photographs. We've got the oysters 
from these experiments that were in uh, the freezer. I've got undergrad working on actually doing tissue weights and so on to see how they ended up. But what's really interesting is somewhere like Paddle Park, we actually see pretty high growth rate initially. The winter comes around, it gets really fresh there, and we didn't get any oysters at Paddle Park that survived past May because I think the salinity was just so uh, bad for them. And then you can see relatively consistent growth uh, through half field, but again, much higher up at the oyster farm, which probably indicates some mix of variables, both probably temperature, it's much warmer up at the oyster farm than half field, and that's probably providing some counterweight to the higher CO2 that's there uh, in a sense. And so we're trying to parse these uh, variables apart a little bit. So our work plan uh, was to implement this space for time study. <clears throat> we're gonna look at Olympia shell and tissue growth throughout the Bay. And just kind of utilize existing collaborations and, and partnerships we have. We've got sensors at both oyster farms, at Sawyer's Landing, Hatfield, and a number of other places. We measure the carbon and chemistry, salinity temperature, and the food quality and quantity, um, synthesizing that environmental data to get a sense of how the system varies over time and space, and looking at the response and where we'd expect things to be optimal in these different um, dimensions or variables. And then in the end is to build this growth model, and this is what we're doing with the Pacific oysters right now, but to relate you know, how that both the sensitivity to these different parameters and what we might be able to predict in the future uh, in terms of their responses. Which, you know, the benefit of that comes into things like where do we target restoration sites? And so understanding where um, might be the best places to sort of find refuges within the estuary. Okay, so what we've, what we've, where we are right now or what's kind of imminent is, is we've got our five sites throughout Equina we're going to deploy oysters at. I've, I've talked with Lou and um, we're just waiting for them to reproduce and, and he's going to, we're going to get about 500 or so Olympia oysters um, that are sort of hardened up enough that we can put them out there and not have to worry too much about the sort of immediate mortality. We're going to deploy about 100 oysters per site and we're going to sample those monthly. We're going to, we're going to um, bring a small field deployable uh, balance out and do this thing called buoyant weight to actually weigh the oyster in water and that gets the shell weights. And we'll take images for size and then each sampling period, we'll take 10 out of that, that, that sampling uh, cage that they're in and we'll do additional tissue and weight composition samples. For the environmental variables, we'll continue the monitoring aspects of this throughout those sites. And then um, in trying to get some handle on the, some of the variants, understanding the impacts of the sloughs and those contributions as well. And so where we are is we're, we're still, the paperwork is, imminent, it seems like. Um, we've, or I know at OSU, we've had some delays in getting grant paperwork through. We've had another project as well recently. We're looking at May to get the uh, Olympias available for outplanting. We've got the oyster, uh, pH sensor at the Oyster Farm since March. I've got a new marine resource management student coming in. Uh, she's going to be, I think her and her uh, fiance are driving up here from Florida like soon and they're going to be here in May and start working in June. Um, I've got some additional undergrads supporting this effort and I've got an RU student, a research experience for undergrads uh, student, it's a program that runs out of uh, both Hatfield and campus and he's coming up from Puerto Rico and is going to spend 10 weeks up here working on this stuff. So I don't know how I, I lost track. I didn't bring my watch with me so I don't know if I'm this was 45 minutes or 10 minutes at this point. You did great. <laughs> you did just great. Thank you, At the George. end of the day, I figured it's quick, better to get through quicker, probably. So. Yeah, yeah. Great presentation. Um, I know I have a question or two. Uh, I'll offer it up to my colleagues first for questions. Nothing to start off with. All right. Um, well, one of my questions is kind of a just a lay science question around a term that you used quite a bit that I don't know that I um, understand exactly how to use it. When you talk about um, buffering capacity, there's the physiochemical aspect of that related to salinity, um, et cetera. I also 
Is there also a biological buffering capacity that can happen in the estuary relative to um, vegetation growth and so forth that can buffer for CO2? And are those, in our, did you use those? Were you talking just about one or, or both? Yeah, so the second part of your question, yes, I was talking primarily about the, um, <clears throat> the buffering capacity associated with ocean water. And ocean water is having higher chemical buffering capacity just based on the amount of alkalinity that's there. But um, yes, the seagrasses and other things can presumably, or they do to some degree, buffer CO2 by, by taking that up through photosynthesis. There's the the literature right now is sort of split on whether that is a truly a um, kind of benefit and it speaks to having to think about different spatial scales because the work Steve did was in within a seagrass bed and what he found and what others have found is that they might create, and we've done these measurements up in Etard's Bay as well, you actually during the day you can get below atmospheric CO2 levels. So you create conditions that are more like pre-industrial conditions, but at nighttime, plants respire. And so at nighttime, we'd actually see higher CO2 concentrations than in surrounding waters. Now, we grew oysters in those. This is a different project. As a master student of mine I finished up two years ago. But we do see that oysters grow better in those seagrass beds. And we think what's happening is something called compensatory growth. And so outside of our larval perspective, where we've got this really short window where things can be good or bad and project that to sort of the outcomes, for, for adult oysters, they're pretty hardy in some ways. And so if during the day conditions are really good, they can grow much quicker. We get actually pre-industrial levels, we can get much higher growth rates. And at night they kind of settle in and just hold on while the conditions are bad. So anyway, so that, that's sort of an aside, but just speaking to the buffering capacity side. So I think one of the challenges is how we talk about these issues with things like phytoremediation. Um, yeah, I would imagine the results would be very different in Yaquina Bay, which is very, you know highly dredged and industrialized compared to more natural systems. Um, it would be great to be able to do a comparison at some point uh, and look at a more natural system versus something more akin to where you're working now. We, we do have the work, we did do these experiments up in Neatarts Bay back in 2015 or so. And I just, it's on the list of publications to write right now, but we have, we actually, I did do an interview with OPB at some point about some of that. So anyway, yeah, there's some of that work's been done is still a lot of details to sort out about, you know, where the benefits are. Again, this work that Steve did indicated that the real true benefits for mitigating the bad conditions come further in the future from CO, from seagrasses and high CO2, but they make current conditions better today. Like the good times are better, but the yeah. bad times are worse. And in the future, <laughs> they make the bad times better, but right now they're making the bad times worse that you're following that at all. There's no free lunch. Right, exactly. <laughs> yep. Great, uh, any follow-up questions for Dr. Waldbusser from the board or alternatively from our audience. Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Dr. Waldbusser for, for, the, for the rundown of, of the project. Um, I, I've got a question and then, and then maybe a comment, um, but I am wondering, um, as, as you likely know, there, there are other projects that we've awarded through this OAH funding package. Um, uh, one of which in particular speaks to the development of an estuary ecosystem model mm -hmm. um, to get at some of those um, dynamics relative to um, estuary function, SAV, oysters, so on and so forth. And I, I'm, I'm just, and, and that project, the one that was awarded um, is focused on Coos Bay, which is a development estuary as well. Um, and I am just, and, and so uh, the question to you maybe is, is one part, but also just a larger comment maybe that um, I'm just hoping that we are not thinking about all these projects as discrete research endeavors, but as a package of a larger effort to understand what's going on on our coast broadly. And, and so I just make maybe a, a, an ask and a request 
to um, to to keep that lot those lines of and I know that a lot of a lot of you know you um, folks know each other um, in academia and are aware of what science pro you know what what projects are going on. But just I want to make sure that any data that gets captured, whether it's in whether it's estuarine or near shore, um, in and that that folks are talking to each other and that information that gets collected maybe in Yaquina relative to some, you know, whether it's a biological, chemical, or physical phenomenon and something that you see, um, you know, a result you see in, in oysters or SAV, like that information gets to the folks who are develop, trying to develop a mechanistic model um, so, so, that, so that we're just making the most out of the information that we're, that we're getting. So um, maybe the question here is to what extent can some of the information you're uh, gathering through your monitoring efforts help to inform mechanistic models, uh, mechanic is, mechanistic estuary uh, models, and um, regardless of the answer to that question, just make just a plea to kind of make sure that all this information is um, is shared so that we can make the most out of what we're what we're doing here. Yeah, so, no, that's, uh, that came. I don't know if I articulated that well, but uh, uh, hopefully, uh, yeah. That I understand, you know, totally understood message received. I'll just to put maybe your mind at a little bit of ease. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm aware of the group down in uh, Melissa Ward, who's I think the PI on, on that, that project maybe, or one of them. Um, it, she's, anyway, Melissa is a lead on a paper I was a co-author on that came out of a couple concurrent seagrass, uh, Oregon Sea Grant projects that we had uh, previously. So the work I alluded to in Etard's Bay. That was funded by Oregon Sea Grant. California Sea Grant funded a project out of the Bodega Group. Melissa was a student there at the time, and um, we we did a data big data synthesis. And so happy to share that kind of stuff. You know, it, it, there's probably some value in some of it. It'll be dependent on how they develop their model. There's a lot of seagrass models that are out there already, and so I suspect what they probably have to do more so is is characterize the extent of coverage. And um, for that given system, and presumably similar approaches could be done here. And we're not targeting the seagrass measurements per se, but we're, those flats, you know, where Sally's Bend is, are all full of seagrass. And we, we sort of, you know, some of the boat surveys we've done go right next to those. And so there's opportunities. Certainly, and I'm happy to, to communicate and interact with other folks on that. So. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, no problem. I'm hopeful we can connect like, you know, Francis's data and, and Bob and Cinnamon's data and, you know, look at some of these bigger picture issues across the whole spectrum, right, from the California current all the way in up to the estuary, because that's been a real sticking point in the estuary side is near all the coastal models right now. Most of them just draw a boundary at the estuary and it's cut off. And the most recent advances have started to put a little bit of water in from the estuary. But there's almost no, no work that's been done on the estuary inside with the chemistry. Um, so, so this sort of data in Yaquina certainly helps to be a validation for that, those sort of future model development as well. So, Great. Thank you very well, much. Well, Madam Chair, I think as a, a follow-up to that, which I think is an excellent idea, and we want to get a better picture of the entire Oregon coast, is maybe periodically during our our meetings that we do ask for progress reports from these projects. And as the PIs are all listening to these presentations together and there can be a real synergy with uh, data uh, compilation and analysis and maybe even uh, looking at some questions that are broader than what the research questions are that each project are specifically addressing. Yeah, so. excellent point. And uh, to Steve's point as well, I think this would be a great conversation perhaps to have in a subsequent meeting as we're, as this is our first big undertaking and now the research, uh, the nearshore research funds will also be a package of funds, really looking at what our role is and what our responsibility is as OOST to facilitate that collaboration, to assist researchers in that collaboration, to make convenings where we can, and to really build that into our, um, our own kind of overall uh, work that we do with everything that we do, because so much of it is already happening as 
Dr. Chan and Cowan's both alluded to as well, there's already a lot of collaboration happening, but how do we, um, what's our role in supporting that as oost? I think it's a good, good conversation for our future meeting. Great, um, any other comments or questions from the board before we go into public comment period and for Members of the public that would like to give public comment today, please type your name in the chat and I will call on you in order that I see them. Um, hoping to hear from, from some of you today. While we're waiting for that, any other um, any other questions for Dr. Waldbesser? I, did, I just, Lord, I did see a comment here from Christine about the hydraulic modeling. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up and just, that's part of our Sea Grant work that actually uh, Jim Lerzak is doing. He has, he had a student formerly, uh, Emily Lamage, who did a nice sort of general model of, of mixing in Yaquina Bay and the work that we've been doing with the profiling and so on is actually filling in and developing a more resolved model that they're getting pretty close to actually have the tidal mixing and discharge dynamics all incorporated in there. So I think there's gonna be some real progress in, in Yaquina. Great. And I'm also um, reminded of a resource that we have in Oregon that we've received presentation from a coin, which does is a partnership that tries to collaborate and bring data together and perhaps we could connect back with them as we're thinking about what our, how we can build capacity in the state and in the region for this kind of work. All right, well, I have one member of the public signed up so far and that would be Charlie Plyben. Charlie? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Charlie Plyben, Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. Uh, really excited to uh, hear all the updates today. It's super, um, I don't know, refreshing after spending a few years in the Oregon legislature unsuccessful. Uh, and uh, really, if you dial back the beginning of all these research efforts, um, they started back in 2010 with the Nearshore Research Task Force. And um, it slowly evolved over time. It took us really close to 11 years to get money out of the Oregon legislature. Um, and, and seeing that repeat again this year was just huge. So um, kudos uh, to our representative and our Senator here um, for keeping that on the radar. Um, I just wanna kind of extend that, um, the conversation around communications and um, more, more explicitly targeting the legislature. Um, there's so much work that our representatives um, can do here in Salem, but uh, after going for the past 11 years uh, and having not a ton of success until 11 years later, I know one thing's for sure is that they could use an education. Um, and so I really encourage uh, for this group to consider using some of these funds um, for some targeted outreach to the legislature. Uh, I think broadening um, sort of the impacts of this work, bringing in sort of commodity commissions, other partners that are participating in the science, um, and really targeting a celebratory event about our oceans uh, would be a really powerful way um, to sort of reinforce uh, these investments that they're making um, and also just let them hear from these real people and these real stories. Um, and everybody loves to line up and eat a little bit of crab. Um, as Representative Gomberg and I have discussed, uh, I think this would be a great opportunity for the Ocean Science Trust. Um, so uh, I just wanna extend that. I think there's a lot of partners, uh, including Surfrider Foundation that would be excited to work with you on that. Um, I also think there's other timely reasons, like the Marine Reserve Assessment, uh, why it would be good for our legislature to hear from uh, ocean constituents about those investments. Um, lastly, I just want to remind you of the presentation I gave back in November uh, on the Rocky Habitat. Uh, you'll remember maybe, um, or you can recall the presentation, there was the last three sides. I gave you some intersections between uh, the Rocky Habitat process um, the territorial sea plan was just approved by the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, and there's still six sites under consideration by the Ocean Policy Advisory Council now. So um, there are some intersections there and some research uh, investments and opportunities 
uh, that could really be a great social intersection uh, as well. Um, again, kind of pointing that um, public eye to the work that we're doing. So thank you so much. And that's all I have. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Charlie. Yeah, it feels almost um, serendipitous how we had, you know, heard from you and Andy Lanier about Rocky Habitat, Tom Calvinese about the Oregon Kelp Alliance, just so much of this uh, work that's already happening. And I think it's just positioned us very well for moving forward with the opportunity that we have. I'll look forward to working with you on it and talking more about uh, some of these ideas that you've uh, discussed with us. Um, I see that Steve Romwell has a question for Dr. Waldbusser. Is that, is that the invitation, uh, Laura, for me? Yes, to... it is. Please, please okay. proceed. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, George, for giving a great presentation. And uh, I just typed in the question. So I uh, just want everybody to know um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, worked with OSU students to place uh, 3 million Olympia oyster uh, staff, uh, tiny juveniles, at a particular study site uh, Coquille Point uh, in Yaquina Bay. So it's upriver from the HMSC monitoring point, but uh, downriver from the, the heart of the population uh, at the oyster farm. But I wanted to just put uh, George on the spot and ask him uh, with the data sets that he has now or the information that you're going to gather in the future, is that a good site for us to continue to invest in efforts to enhance? The populations of Olympia oysters, or do you think we'd be better off moving further towards uh, the, the mouth of the bay or further towards uh, uh, Toledo? Yeah, it's a great question, Steve. I, you know, we that's a spot where we've had some temperature and <clears throat> sensors out there, occasionally salinity. We haven't measured the DIC or the carbonate chemistry there regularly because most of the time we access that point is by foot. Yeah. So it gets hard to get a water sample when you're standing on where the water is supposed to be. Um, but it's a site that you and I certainly have talked about quite a bit, and I think it'll be interesting. We could certainly, um, well, we should follow up and see. I don't know what, what the plans are, if you have any for monitoring the growth there at some frequency, but we could certainly, um, you know, add some additional sampling. We do have sampling. We've been doing it at Sawyer's Landing, which is just around the corner from there. So that would give us some sense of the surface water chemistry in a sense and and certainly one opportunity with some of the sampling techniques would be to get out there and just do some time series on a day night sort of basis to see that sort of variability um you know king slough is is you know adjacent on the other side from there and they they do very well growing oysters up there again pacifics so it'll be interesting to see how the olympias do we just you know as you know we just don't have a lot of information on them in general so Hopefully we'll fill in some of those gaps. Yeah, thanks, George. And this also uh, just points to some of the practical um, out outcomes. It'd be great to have George's work and the monitoring at the HMSC Center already uh, in hindsight, but we're moving ahead with these kinds of projects and we're gonna be better informed uh, after a couple more years about uh, where should we, we should be placing these kind of efforts. So thanks very much. Oh, great. Interesting report, Steve. I did not know that there were 3 million Olympia oysters spat nearly a half a mile from my house where I sit right now. That's very exciting to me. Um, all right, great. Uh, I don't see anyone else uh, willing, willing, <laughs> wanting to uh, engage in public comment. So uh, with that, we'll close the public comment period. And uh, we're right on track just to give a couple of small updates, allow for any additional updates and uh, be out on time. So my only one additional update for the OOST board is regarding our um, web page overhaul. I was contacted by DSL staff um, yeah, several months back about really breathing some life into our current website, which is just kind of like a laundry list of a bunch of technical boring information that doesn't really speak to most people. 
um, Lisa has done a really good job of updating the OAHRFP site with more interesting things that are happening. So the desire is to have a OOST web page that can support both the project work that we do and give some of the boring information that we do in a more interesting way. So um, all of that information has been submitted and I received an update from staff that uh, we probably won't be seeing a launch of that until late summer or early fall of this year. But in the meantime, DSL is going to work with us just to include a little bit of more information on the existing site about our mission, funding opportunities, grant opportunities, details on how to donate to the trust and updating the bios on our members. So that's my update for you on our website project. Are there any other member updates from out there in cyber land? All right, I'm not seeing anybody jumping to hit their mute, get their mute buttons off. So um, I don't have any other business. Um, I would like you to um, plan for an in-person meeting for our July meeting, um, most likely at uh, our previous meeting location in Salem at DSL headquarters. It would be lovely to see some faces again in real time. And I presume it would be a hybrid meeting that would offer both online and in-person options. I also um, would just say there's a very good likelihood that I may be calling you all in board members for a interim meeting to approve projects uh, in as much as we could get that work done before the July meeting. So if our committee is able to come up with a projects list for your approval in late May or early June, I'd like to um, you know, have the opportunity to keep things moving forward and not have to wait because we have a quarterly schedule. So that's all I have for you all today. Thank you, particularly to the PIs for doing the good work. To Lisa for coordinating that and staff of uh, DSL, Raina, uh, for keeping us organized. And Andy, thank you too. Hopefully we'll be doing some good work on that Rocky management plan in the near future. Okay, thank you, you to everyone. It's good All to right. see everyone. Thank, thank you, you for everyone. the opportunity. Yeah, thank uh, you.